leading everyday people to love Jesus and make Him known. Here's our pastor, Dr. Larry LeBlanc. Join me again in taking your Bibles and turning to the book of James. We're in James chapter 1 this morning, verses 16 through 18, as we continue our journey together through the book of James. This morning, we're going to be looking at God's goodness and God's gifts. And so we want to thank so much uh, the choir and the worship team, as always, for leading us in worship. Reese, thank you so much. Fantastic job this morning. So glad. It's so it's a blessing to me to see young men and young women who grew up in this church's ministry who not only serve the Lord well, but are willing to take on leadership roles. And so I'm thankful to be led to the throne of grace, thankful for what you did this morning, and thankful, as always, this morning to get to open God's Word with you this morning. Um, I wonder, j- just out of curiosity, how many of you in here at some point, maybe you do it regularly or, or maybe just once or twice, but how many of you in here have used a grocery or pickup delivery app? You have gone and to, to somewhere and some of you in here have quit shopping. You either have it sent to the house or you have it ready for pickup. You've used that at an online real, real through. Some of you do all of your grocery shopping that way. Um, I, I personally, I don't, um, but if you do, I don't think it's sinful. I just haven't gotten into that yet, but, but some of you, that that's the way you operate. I can see why, because you don't have to go in the store. You don't have to make that time. You can do it on your time. You, uh, the way it's supposed to work is you show up and they have all of your groceries ready. They place it in your car and you go home, or if you take it even a step farther, they deliver it to your house. But, but I think from what I just saw, most of you in here have at least tried that, right? You, you, you've done it a time or two. You're familiar with the process. So that leads me to question number two. How many of you that have tried this have had something substituted for something you ordered that made no sense? You got home and you opened up the bag and you thought, I didn't order this. And you kept looking and realizing, but wait a minute, I did order this and it, it's not there. And you got to looking through, through your receipt and realized that someone thought, someone thought that substituting breakfast sandwiches for ice cream was close because evidently they both came out of the freezer section. Or maybe it is that you opened it up and, and, and you ordered bell peppers. You, you needed some bell peppers to cook, but for some reason, instead of bell peppers, you ended up with a dozen roses. Because everybody cooks with roses. Or maybe it is that, that you opened up because you had a sick child, and when you put in your order, you ordered a thermometer. But instead of a thermometer, they put two boxes of macaroni and cheese. Maybe it is that you ordered a COVID test. But instead of the COVID test, you opened up the bag and you found Hall's lozenges inside the bag. Or maybe, maybe you thought, you know, I I need some more horseradish. That's not something that a lot of times people go through a lot, but but if you need it, you need it, I guess, if you like horseradish. But you looked into the bag, and instead of a jar of horseradish, they put two cans of beets. Now, I don't know if those are exactly the experiences you have, but for every single one of you that in here have done it, there are probably still things that are sitting in your cabinet. They're not what you wanted. They're not what you needed, nor are they what you ordered. And it's interesting that as we find ourselves in James, when we think about the person of God, when you go before the Lord and you ask the Lord to work in your life, when you ask the Lord to do things in your life, you need to know that we serve a God who is not about off-the-wall substitutions, that he's never a God who substitutes anything inferior, and there is never a shortage of anything in the economy of God. Which leads us to the passage at hand, but, but to catch you all up, last week we talked about 
the nature of temptation. We talked about the source of temptation and the force of temptation and the course of temptation, which leads us all the way up to verse 16, which is where we're going to start. But before we stand up and read it together, I want you to see verse 16 for what it is. Verse 16 is a transition verse. Some commentators put it with the verses before it, and some commentators put it with the verses that we're going to read together. But when it says, do not be deceived, my brothers and sisters, go back to verse 13 when it said, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. So, you see verse 16 is that transition in that nothing bad, nothing evil, temptation does not come from God. Don't be deceived. Only good things flow from God, which is the message of verse 17 that we're going to read together in just a moment. So now that we've made that connection, let's stand together and we'll begin reading in verse 16. James 1, 16. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of firstfruits of all he created. Lord, we bow before you today and thank you that you have called us not to live a life of deception, but to come under the humble recognition that you are God are good. You are always good. And Lord, the gifts you give to your children are always good. Help us to see that today in this text. In Jesus' name and all of God's people said, please be seated. And so what we prayed this morning, that is our big idea. You'll see that on the screen as you're taking notes this morning. Do not be deceived. God is good and he gives good gifts to his children. So we're going to break that down this morning really into two main points and jump right in. And the first point comes directly from verse 17. We read that together. We're going to look specifically at God's goodness. We're going to look at the goodness of God. So James makes the point that obviously temptation, sin, and evil from the verses prior, those do not come from God. So we see this transition that happens in verse 16, and then James clarifies that only every good and perfect gift comes from our Creator God, or the Father of lights who does not change like shifting shadows. All throughout Scripture, and you know this, purity, righteousness, morality, goodness, holiness, those things are associated with light, evil, wickedness, unrighteousness, immorality, those things are associated with darkness. So when it says that the Father of heavenly lights, it creates, it brings two things to our mind. Number one, the God who made everything, including the heavenly lights, and the God who is the author of light or of all goodness. That is our God and that is our provider. And because he is holy, 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 we sang it this morning, there is but one thing that can flow from his holy throne, and that is righteousness and goodness. No temptation, no evil can flow from the throne of God. It's interesting that, that even in the past year, as astronomers continue to, to up their technology and be able to discover more things that are in our galaxy and even in our universe, that is just recently they have located what they believe to be at the present time the brightest known object in our universe or the brightest known object in our universe that they have found so far. It is a K quasar and it is 12 billion light years away from Earth. I can't even understand the physics of 12 billion light years away. Let's just say it's a long, long way. But not only is it 12 billion light years away, get ready for this, it burns 500 trillion times brighter and then hotter than our own sun. It burns 500 trillion times. And this is just one quasar that they have found in the entirety of the universe. So if you'll let your mind early on a Sunday morning, think about the expanse of the universe and the number of stars and the brightness of which we're able to see all that God has done, not only in the night sky, but that burning, hot June sun that's outside right now. Praise God for air conditioning. 
that when you witness all of that, that was made by the same God you worship who is the Father of heavenly lights. He is the Father of all light. He is the Father of all goodness, all holiness, all purity. They've done studies recently with darkness. And, and, and many of you in here know what it is to be immersed in complete darkness. I'm not talking about that you can see a faint light at the end of the hallway. I'm not talking about that there's a dim light somewhere out on the horizon. I'm asking you, have you ever been in a place where it was completely and totally dark? You literally could not see your hand in front of your face. Have you ever, have you ever spent time in that type of environment? It's hard to find that type of environment because even at night or in our homes, there's often ambient light that you can find somewhere. But if you were to place yourself in an enclosed room that was totally dark, if you were to go to the bottom of a cave where there was no light that was possible and you found yourself there, if you've ever been there, you know that it's completely disorienting. It doesn't take long before you don't know left from right, up from down. If you spend any amount of time there, it's very difficult to even figure out how you entered, whether you came from which side of the room. And it is so incredibly difficult to learn to navigate that scientists have now done studies and they found that 40 hours of being in total darkness can cause hallucinations. And that if continued it actually can bring about insanity in the human mind if not ever brought out of that darkness. There's a reason that God is associated with light and that evil and sin is associated with darkness. Because even those who don't believe in God, those that claim to be atheists, what they may not realize is even though that there's a God that they say they don't believe in, they still experience the goodness of God. You, you hear it say in the Bible that, that it, it rains on the just and the unjust. What we know is even those whose hearts are filled with wickedness, that in God's common grace, they are enjoying some forms of the goodness of God, even if it is that all they do is recognize that there is light that they would not enjoy without the Father of heavenly lights. And so as we begin to try to wrap our minds around the goodness of God, we, we begin to look and see how important it is to recognize where every good gift comes from. We talked about the light, but you name it. I, I want to give you, I want to give you uh, just about 10 seconds here. And during that 10 seconds, I would like for you to name at least five things that you are incredibly thankful for. I want you to think about some gifts of God that outside of the Lord's blessing you would not enjoy. Are you ready? Go. It probably didn't take you that long. In fact, we're probably overwhelmed at how much we have to be thankful for. But sometimes I think the issue is, is that we forget that every good and perfect gift, that you have nothing good that didn't come from God, that everything that you could possibly think of in your life, the things that you take for granted and the things that you don't take for granted, every good and perfect gift is from the Lord. Which brings me to a, a, a poll that, that, that I came across recently that disturbed me. Maybe this won't bother you as bad as it bothered me, but I found this disturbing. They polled children. Did you know that one-third of children think that cheese comes from plants? Do you know that one-third, this one really bothers me, because even in the name, one-third of children think that fish fingers are from chicken or pigs. Now, if you have a child, and I love y'all, y'all know I love you, but if you go home and ask your child today, where do fish fingers come from? And they say chicken. You've got a problem on your hands, okay? So don't know where cheese comes from. Don't know where fish fingers come from. One out of 10 children think that tomatoes grow underground. One third of five to eight year olds think that pasta and bread come from meat. 
and 10% of children think potatoes grow on trees. Look, those are real stats. It, there seems to be a movement, and I like to think that maybe in more rural environments, maybe we're doing a little better than those averages. I, I would like to think that because we're maybe a little more rural or, or agrarian, that, that, that our children, I think, would do better than this. But you see the danger, we talk about it all the time, and not knowing where your food comes from. We talked about delivery apps and all of those things, and not, not knowing what's in your foods and all that we talk about, all that we talk about. But if that's dangerous, how much more dangerous is it not to have the humble recognition of where every gift comes from. And I feel like even for believers sometimes, if we're not careful, we pass over the gifts of God without the recognition that they come from the Father of heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. It reminds me of one of our favorite hymns, Great is Thy Faithfulness. There is a line in Great is Thy Faithfulness, and it says this, There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. We serve a God who does not change. He, he is not like everything else in our culture, but he remains the same, and his goodness never, ever ends many of you can probably picture a, a birthday or a christmas where you had a small child that was there and you were giving them gifts and many of you go overboard when it comes to gift giving and just try to make sure that they have everything they want and more but how many of you gift givers have ever been discouraged because at the end of the gift giving, no matter how much you gave, no matter how many presents have been opened, that at the end of it, you can look up at the child and you recognize that there is some disappointment there because the gift opening is now done. There, there's nothing left and they're, they're looking around trying to find another package or another present, hoping that there's one more and you're left thinking, are you kidding me? No, there's not any more. This was more than we ever should have done in the first place. And, and you look up wondering, do they not recognize what all we did to make the gifts that they did open? Do they not realize that that took a lot? Here's the incredible thing when it comes to the gifts of God. Because you're a child of God, the gifts don't run out. And I'm not talking about materialism. I'm not talking about the prosperity gospel. I'm talking about the goodness of God on toward you has never been exhausted. He's never quit giving you good gifts. He's never quit taking care of you. He's never not giving you what you need because not only is he a good God that does not change like shifting shadows, but continually we enjoy the goodness of God. So we see the goodness of God, but secondly, we need to pay very close attention to verse 18. Because verse 18 teaches us about God's greatest gift. God's greatest gift. This is a powerful, short verse of Scripture, James 1.18. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. So we see God's goodness in verse 17, and then we see God's greatest gift in verse 18. This new life, this new birth, this regeneration that it's talking about, that he gave us birth. In John 3, when he told Nicodemus, you must be what, church? You must be born again. You must become a new creature in Christ. You must be remade. Your sins must be forgiven. You must be delivered. You must be redeemed or purchased back. You must be justified or made to be not guilty before a holy God. All of those things are encapsulated in the power of this verse. So I want to talk about this gift of salvation, this greatest gift. Because when I gave you those 10 seconds a little while ago to catch your breath and to think about the goodness of God, and you thought about all that he's done, friends, 
as important as our family is and important is the things we enjoy and the, the sunshine that we see and all of the things that we talk about. If you are redeemed, if you're a child of God, if you've been born again and justified, the greatest gift that God has ever given you is to rescue you out of the dominion of darkness and place you in the company of those who walk in the light. Because no longer are you marred by the evil of darkness, but now you are characterized as a child of his that walks in light. And this verse breaks that down very, very clearly because, number one, we want to talk about the origin of this greatest gift. The origin of this greatest gift. Look with me at what he says. It says in verse 18, He chose. He chose to give us. He chose to give the gift. He chose to give the gift. One of the things that's so important in salvation is for you to realize that you are the recipient of the gift. That it is not because you chose God, but because God chose you. And in your wickedness, and in your evilness, and in your vileness, and in your sin-sick condition, no one who is lost has ever chosen God. We would remain in our sin and remain in our wickedness, but the beauty of salvation is that before the foundation of the world, the Lord looked down through the corridors of time, and what we know is that He chose us. The only way life could be given to the dead because they have no awareness of their sin. They have no desire to turn. We don't have the power to change. In fact, those that are dead in their sins, they don't even know they're dead. So, so I want to give you a, just a, a quick rundown of what everyone is who is lost in their sins, what you were before you were rescued, before he chose and We've deemed this the uns, the uns, U-N-S. What were you before you were chosen by God to receive salvation? Here's what you were. You were unresponsive. You were unperceptive. You were unteachable. And you were unrighteous. There was nothing in you. No child. We are celebrating. I made the comment the other day. God is blessing this church, and I mean in incredible ways. We saw 11 decisions just last week. We're baptizing two in the next service. People are continually getting saved and born again, but we're also being blessed by a lot of young families. I had a, a moment in one of the services. I, I was looking around, and I thought, man, everybody in here is pregnant. We're going to have to build. We are. We're going to build a new nursery and preschool because y'all are filling it up. That's awesome. Keep going. Right? Now, now, I want you to think for just a moment. All these pregnant people running around. And by the way, don't ask anybody if they're pregnant. That's just a tip. Don't ask them how their pregnancy's going. Don't ask them when they're due. I've done that one time and was wrong, and it was enough for me never to ask that question again. Because I didn't know if you know this, but women that aren't pregnant don't like to be asked if they're pregnant. That, that has nothing to do with this. I just thought I'd share that with you because I love y'all. Back to it. No one that's ever been born was born of their own will. The only reason that anyone was born in the first place, the only reason is because their parents came together. It wasn't their choice. And just like you weren't born of your own will the first time, you were not born of your own will the second time. Jesus made it very clear. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Jesus, again, you did not choose me, but I chose you. Friends, this is not a reason for arrogance. This is a reason for humility to fall before the throne of grace and say there was nothing good in me. I couldn't even make a choice outside of the grace and sovereignty of a holy God. He chose. He chose God's greatest gift. He chose. But secondly, that was the origin of the gift. But secondly, look, let's look at the operation of the gift. The operation of the gift. Because it says also in 18 that he chose to give us birth 
through the word of truth. That is the operation through the word of truth. Ephesians 5, 26, by the washing of water with the word. Romans 10, 17, faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God or the word of truth. No one, no one, no one has ever been converted apart from the word of God. No one has ever been saved apart from the word of God. You say, now, wait a minute. Not everybody that's been saved may have been reading their Bible when they were saved. No one has ever been converted apart from the word of God. Because the only way that someone can get saved is by the gospel. And the only way that someone knows the gospel is by the word of God. So either through reading the word of God, through preaching the word of God, through sharing the word of God, through teaching and expositing the word of God, if you are saved, not only do we give glory to the Father of heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows, but we give glory to that God and we give glory to the Word of God because you can get saved apart from the Word. So that is not only the origin He chose, but it is the operation of the Word of God. Regeneration or this new birth that is described here is when God sovereignly acknowledges a person's belief of the gospel and credits him with the full righteousness of the very Son of God. Um, it's interesting some years to just look this up, but Merriam-Webster, the people that put out dictionaries, we used to have paper ones of those. Y'all remember those? They were kind of neat. Merriam-Webster's Word of the Year for 2023. Anybody know what it was? The Word of for 2023 that they voted was the word authentic. Authentic. It seems that we are in an era that is facing an authenticity crisis. And so because of that, it seems that we value it even more. And in an age of lies and in an age of deception and in an age of untruths, we turn to the infallible, inerrant, Word of God, inspired by God Himself and authoritative for our life, for our practice, and for our salvation. The origin of the greatest gift, the operation of the greatest gift, and then finally, the outcome of the greatest gift. Because you were chosen, and then you received this new birth through the Word of Truth, and then you see a comma there, and it says that. That what? That we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. That's the outcome, that we would become first fruits of all he created. So the reason for salvation, and we don't have a ton of time to spend on this point, but it's worth spending just a moment here. There are so many people that have salvation confused because they see salvation as being man-centered. And salvation is anything but man-centered. God didn't save you primarily because of you. God saved you because of who He is. And so the primary purpose is not just to benefit man, but to fulfill the purpose of God. And what was the purpose of God? That we would be a kind of first fruits. Now remember, He is speaking to Jewish believers 40 to 50 A.D., the very first believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, these Messianic Jews who had accepted Christ, and these Jewish believers were the first of many in God's spiritual harvest. Think about it for a moment. You didn't get where you are on your own, that you're the product of many generations. Some of you are into ancestry and genealogy and all of those things. But think about it now that for over 2,000 years that we are the product of generations of people chosen by God, passing on the word of truth and becoming saved. And what James is saying to this group of people is you are among the first fruits of all he created. When we think about the first fruits, those were the very first and the very best of the crops. And so they came and they were presented before the Lord. 
But for every one of us, we need to know that there is coming a day where there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And all of us as believers will be the first fruits because we will be the first installment of all of God's new creation. It's incredible to think what the power of God unto salvation is, not only in the origin of that salvation, in the operation of that salvation, but in the outcome. It's amazing how God's good gifts just keep coming and coming and coming. I read the story recently of Owen Williams. He and his wife and their little daughter, Katie, moved into a brand new home in a new neighborhood. And when they moved in, it hadn't been even spent the night yet when an elderly gentleman named Ken Watson who lived next door, came and knocked on the door and just welcomed them to the neighborhood. And over the course of days, weeks, and months, and years, Ken Watson became like a grandfather to this family. He loved them and took care of them and checked on them. And their little daughter, Katie, even had names for him as he would come over because she knew him so well. And then one day, Ken Watson went to the doctor and and found out that he had been given a terminal diagnosis. And he thought about what he wanted to do and the legacy he wanted to leave and how he wanted to be remembered. And I think this is incredible. So before he died and before he got to where he couldn't get around, he went and he bought 14 different Christmas presents for the little girl next door. With instructions in his will to his daughter that for every year for the next 14 years, a present was to be delivered to this little girl so that she would never forget all throughout her teenage years and even into young adulthood about a man who lived next door who loved her and cared about her. So there are 14 wrapped gifts that get delivered to her parents' door after he passes away. And I couldn't help but think as I'm just overwhelmed by the emotion of that story that the Lord Jesus Christ on the night he was betrayed, that he looked down through the corridors of time and when he saw your justification and he saw your sanctification and he saw your glorification and he saw all that he was going to bless you with because of the gospel, when he, when he saw your choosing and he saw the operation of the word of truth in your life and he saw the first fruit that you would become, All of those things are like continual gifts that God keeps showering on you because He is a good God and every perfect gift is from Him coming down from the Father of heavenly lights who doesn't change like shifting shifts. You are continually being a recipient of the goodness and the gifts of God that followed from the death of His perfect and His righteous Son. I wonder how many of you right now, either at home, maybe in your wallet right now, how many of you have a gift card somewhere that's unused? Someone has given you a gift card and you have not redeemed it yet. Now, how many of you can find that gift card right now? You know that you could put your hands on it right now if you had to. Why do I bring that up? I find find this fascinating. Two-thirds of Americans have at least one spent unspent gift card. Two-thirds of Americans have at least one unspent gift card. Half of those, half of the unspent gift cards will never get spent. So if you do the math on that, That means there is $21 billion in unspent money out there. That is a crying shame. That's ridiculous. If I get a gift card, I try not to let it last 24 hours. There is no reason to save that. Inflation's going up. Your gift card's losing value. Every day that you don't spend it, it's not worth as much as it was the day before. Someone gave it to you to spend it. You might as well spend it. You might as well burn it up. It's not going to magically become cash. You need to use it. And 
I, I thought about how ridiculous that is, that there's some people that don't just have one. There's some of you, because I saw it when I said it, you kind of did one of these. That means you've got a pile of them somewhere, and your Sunday afternoon project ought to be to spend them. Or if you just are adverse to spend them, call me. I'll come get them. There's no reason for them to sit in your drawer. That is ridiculous. Now, if that's crazy, which I submit that it is, that's crazy, to have unused gift cards, then how crazy is it that God in his infinite glory and in his mercy, has given you out of the goodness of his character the greatest gift of all, salvation through the person and work of his one and only begotten son, Jesus Christ, crucified on Calvary's tree, raised on the third day, ascended to the right hand of God the Father, and offering you life through repentance of sin and turning to Him in surrender. If you won't take that gift, then the Bible says you're a fool. If you've never received the gift of God that is salvation, then today should be the day that you run, not walk under the Father of heavenly light, who does not change. Leading everyday people to love Jesus and make Him known.